Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Remote No Pressure podcast. I'm so glad to be here uh, broadcasting live from the cornfield somewhere in Michigan. Actually, it's not somewhere. It's it's not some secret bat cave or anything. It's in West Michigan, and I happen to live right next to a cornfield. And as most of you know, I don't literally mean I'm in a cornfield. It's outside. But nonetheless, it's exciting to be here. It's exciting to be behind the microphone yet again for another episode of the Remote No Pressure podcast. This week, if you read the title of your email, if you're not on the mailing list, get on the mailing list. But if you read the title of the mailing list, if you read, you know, however you got here, you probably know who our guest is, um, April Vokey. And we're very excited to have her. We're going to jump right into that interview here in a minute. Um, but I'm just very thankful. I'm thankful that you came and, de- and decided to join us this week and just to put the earbuds in and check out what's going on. Um, one, you know, we, we talk, if, if you've been listening to this podcast for very long, we talk a lot about corporate stress. We talk, I, I came out of finance, as most of you know, and it's a very stressful occupation. And a lot of the people that we've talked to, um, you know, people who've survived war, uh, PTSD, survivors of cancers, of, of you know, we had some, some people who were electrocuted, you know, um, barely survived. And, and yet, time and time again, um, the constant, the, the thing that can always comes out is, you know, they wear outdoors. They all fly fish. But I don't, I don't think it's just a fly fishing. I think a lot of it's just getting outdoors and coping with life. You know, and the thing about fly fishing is you're going through, you know, you're, you're casting and it's got this rhythm and you can't really think of anything except fishing. And I think that's what, what helps us deal with the stress. I think, and, and we always talk about how fly fishing, fly fishing saves lives. So before we jump in with April, I, I had this article come across my desk of the, the most stressful jobs in America. And we're going to do a countdown. Yes, a countdown, super, super crazy countdown of the top uh, most stressful jobs in America. Drum roll, please. We have a senior corporate executive at number nine. I think my I think my battery just died. My battery just died. My battery died. We have number nine, senior corporate executive. Number eight a public relations executive, number seven, a broadcaster. You know, that would be a tough job. That would be a tough job. Number six, newspaper reporter. Number five is an event coordinator. You know, a big shout out to all of you. If you're a wedding planner and you're listening to this, you don't get paid enough money. You don't get paid enough money. Number four, police officers. Number three, airplane pilot. Oh my God, I can't imagine. Number two, firefighters. And the number one, most stressful job. Okay, the most stressful job, according to this article from Reader's Digest, the number one most stressful job is being in the military. Topping the list of the most stressful jobs in America for 2018 is the listed military personnel at the E3 level, meaning they have at least six years of experience. They're faced with uh, trauma, life-threatening situations, and can spend years living in hostile environments away from their family and away from their home. I know I know a lot of you out there, I mean, we've talked to a lot of people with PTSD from, um, you know, uh, ex-military or, I know they hate the word ex-military, not a former military, um, former military who's dealt with PTSD or we've had some corporate executives that come on here that are maybe even in the industry that are dealing with stress. And I just want to encourage you to, to go fishing, to get out there and, um, and go fishing, hang out with us here on the remote, no pressure podcast. If you're in Michigan, let's go fishing. I'll go fishing with you. I don't care. I don't care where you are. If you want to go fishing, let's just go fishing. But more than anything, just get out get out of your ordinary and let's let's just get out of this stressful craziness. This week on the Remote No Pressure podcast, we have April Vokey. Does she really need an introduction? Welcome to the podcast. Let's light the fire. Well, today on the Remote No Pressure podcast, we have April Vokey with us. Thank you very much for joining us, April. Well, thanks for having me. 
So you, before we get started, I mean, first of all, thank you very much for, for hanging out with us. But also, you're a new mom. So how, how's that going for you? It is very, very cool. Um, it's, it, I always say to people, I'm like, oh, you know, it really hasn't made that much of a difference. But I'm sitting here outside right now trying to talk to you. And all I can hear at the corner of my ear is like, twinkle, twinkle, little star. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, I feel like I have to have, um, I have to compartmentalize my, my brain. But other than that, um, things have been rolling pretty steady. And she's just the coolest thing in the whole world. That's awesome. And I, I know that probably a lot of people are asking questions about being a new mom and, and this and that, but I also know that you're very passionate about fishing. So let me ask you this question. Whenever you go on a fishing adventure, a lot of times, uh, or I should say sleep deprivation is a big part of most great fishing adventures. Would you mm-hmm. compare that to having a child and being sleep deprived? That is a great question. I think, (laughs) I think about this often, actually. Uh, I was thinking about this last night. I have never needed a lot of sleep. I've always, because I I like to fish in the day and then I like to work all night. I've always operated on a really small amount of sleep. Um, And I honestly think it gets me through being a mom because everyone's like, oh, you know, you're not going to sleep. And I I have a baby and, and she does wake up every three hours and I don't feel any different than how I felt before. So, um, yeah, I guess, I guess for most people it's probably deprivation, but for me, it's just like owning a fishing company. Yeah. (laughs) It's not much, it's not much different than being an entrepreneur, no sleeping allowed, or there's always something, especially with you being, uh, in British Columbia and also in Australia half the year, there's gotta be some time differences when you talk to people, and when you're doing business, I mean, we're in a 24 hour news cycle. So that, that probably has an effect on you as well, right? Yeah. You finish all, so I'll finish all of my American, e- all my North American emails <laughs> and I'll get the last one done and I'm like, oh yeah, oh, I'm good. And then all of a sudden all the Australian emails start flooding in and it's like, ah, oh, shit, I just can't win with you guys. <laughs> so I have a, I have a thing though. I don't answer emails. Very rarely do I answer emails the same day. So I'll... Like what I do is I have a, a flagging system to stay organized. So I I flag all my emails. I've got like um, like immediate emails are red. To print emails are orange. To fall, um, have I heard back from? Because people in this industry take forever to get back to you. <laughs> so I have like yellow flag is have I'm waiting to hear back from somebody. Um, what is um, yeah blue is um, I need internet. Like I've got all these flags and then. Um, or oh, what is green? Yeah, green is to follow up on later. So I've got this flagging system I've had for the last like seven or eight years, and um, and uh, what I do is I'll start at the the I'll go up to the dates in the emails because obviously they're organized in the inbox by date, and anything that is that says today or like you know it doesn't say yesterday or if it's got today's date I just ignore it because otherwise you get stuck in the system where you're responding back and forth and you, you just turn into like a on a 24 hour chat machine, <laughs> an auto, a responder almost. That's all you do all day. That could really suck away some hours for sure. Yes. And I, and I say that cause I, excuse me, I wish everyone would follow suit because all that's happened now is you don't get back to someone in two days. Cause you're, you're in the middle of nowhere <laughs> and people are like, uh, I'm following up. Have you got my email? And you're going, Hey, hello. It used to take seven days for people to respond to emails, but just back off there a little bit. Like, Nobody should be responding to emails in a matter of seconds. So oh I wish, I hope, I hope everyone listening <laughs> takes a step back so that we can just be fishermen again and not auto responders. Yes. Yes. Very, very good point. And it's like my wife, we have two, two boys and she'll be at the grocery store and people will text her and they're like, where are you? Or, you know, what do you, do? they want an immediate response. And she's like, I've got two boys, little boys in a grocery store. I'm just trying to survive. And here you are, like, <laughs> ask you, you know what I mean? And it's like before, way back in the day, if you wanted to get a hold of a mom, you had to call. And if she was at the grocery store, you had to leave a message on a voicemail. And then you like had to wait for her to get back to you, you know? But now it's like, yeah. you better get back to me in the next 30 seconds. Or I want to text you and then text you again. So being, you know, <laughs> being a parent, it's like, oh my God, send me a pic of what, what's he doing? He's looking at Fruit Loops. It's okay. You know, <laughs> like, 
Holy cow. But it's like, it, it's so true though, isn't it? And it's just a constant, like, it's a constant balance. I mean, I have a 48 hour rule. I could have respond to people within 48 hours. I think there's a level of professionalism that needs to obviously go along with, um, with owning a business, regardless of the industry that you're in. But, um, yeah, I do miss the days where it was just expected that you'd take a few days to respond. And, you know, iPhones, do they have a Marcus unread button? Because I literally will not open a text message because if it's if it's marked as read and I won't have time to respond to it, I can't get back to it. Um, I'll forget to get back to it. I have to leave it marked as unread. Mm-hmm. Do you know that if there's a way to mark as unread on email, on uh, text messages on iPhones? You know, I'm I'm not exactly sure, but I know with like iMessage, they can see if you've read it or not. And I don't. Oh want... no, 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 no! <laughs> First thing you have to do is change that tick mark because nobody is going to see anything that I've read or not because that is how invasive is that? It's none of your business that I've seen your message. Mark it. Go into your settings and change it so that they cannot see that you've seen it. It's crazy. That's seriously. I'd rather somebody say, "Well, no, I wouldn't." But I was going to say it's like having someone standing at your window being like, "Ooh, I know what you're wearing right now." <laughs> nobody can see that that closely into your life. <laughs> yeah, I totally agree. It's totally insane. I'm not sure if the iPhone has that capability to mark as unread. I'm pretty sure it does, but I'm not super technically inclined. I have an iPhone, but I probably use one 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 hundredth of what it's capable of doing, you know. Right. So, so if anyone listening to this knows that answer, please let us know. And whoever is close to Jeff, can you please go to his settings and make it so the people cannot see that he's seen your text message? Please email, <laughs> please text me the directions on how to, <laughs> how to mark that as unread. So a, a question for you. With, with our society right now, especially being a business owner, um, and there's so many demands we're always on the go. And, and I came out of finance. I worked in finance and there's so many demands on us all 24 seven as a society. How do you think, what, what do you think fly, how do you think fly fishing should fit in as a cure to, to some of the stresses that people have ex, are experiencing right now? Cause it's 24 seven, right? So what do you recommend as a guide, as a business owner, as a mom, to people about fly fishing and, and how that can be a way to kind of break the cycle. Yeah. Well, you know, Ooh, that's such a deeply, that is such a deep question. I have so many answers to that. Um, it depends on the person, right? So, I mean, I can't speak on behalf of everybody else. I can just speak on behalf of, of me because that's the only person, I'm the only person I really know that well. Mm. And it, it you know, it, I get the life sucked out of me by being in fluorescent lighting and in buildings. Like I just got back from ICAST in Florida and it's just exhausting. It's just so unnatural. And, and for me, I need to be outside to just simply feel like a human being. And I don't know. I mean, that's such a good, you know, it's a big argument. Are we born with the gene of being hunters and gatherers and needing to be outside or not? But Mm. I think it's pretty hard to deny that human beings are and homo sapiens are supposed to be outside. Like that's what we've done our entire lives. So I think it's just as simple as, um, it's just natural to, to get outside. So I don't even think someone needs to be fly fishing. I think they just need to be outside. And when you want to, you know, introduce the fly fishing aspect and why is it a cure or how is it healthy? I think a lot of it has to do with meditation. I think anyone who meditates um, will agree with me that there is something highly meditative without um, focusing on nothing but the elements or nothing but your casting or nothing but your presentation. And I know that my husband used to get really weird about that. He'd be like, oh, meditation, that's for a bunch of, you know, dirty hippies. And I'm going, <laughs> hold on there, Hoss, because, you know, he's really corporate and he, he works in the corporate world. And I was like, well, let, I want to introduce meditation to you. And it took me five years for him to finally do it. I, I said, just give me two minutes of your time. Put him on the couch, had him close his eyes for two minutes and just focus on the sound of the toilet because we had a broken toilet. <laughs> so <laughs> that's all he had to do. And he's like, oh, but what happens when other thoughts come into my mind? And it was like, well, they are going to come into your mind. And just the whole, that is what meditation is, is focusing on one thing and kicking those thoughts out. You're not going to be perfect at it and it takes practice, but kicking those thoughts out and focusing on the toilet is one thing. Um, I mean, he felt great after and he continues to practice that, um, that, that meditation, but think about the sounds when you're outside, like if focusing on the toilet made him better, imagine on being outside and having the sounds of the river Mm -hmm. and then say that you want to have your eyes open. Well, 
when you're staring at the flow of the river and its consistency like that, it's the perfect place really to be able to get into that headspace. So I, th- I think meditation, uh, as far as uh, clearing space in our heads, is really important. And I think that fly fishing is the perfect way to do it. Yeah, that's a, that's a great answer. And it takes it takes some maturity as well to say, I don't know about everyone else, but I know what works for me because it seems like everyone wants to preach at other people. And no one likes to get preached at, April. So I really appreciate that answer. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I'm just over it. And you know, you know what it is that lit for me, Jeff? Um, I was never that sensitive to the preaching stuff. And in fact, I was really open to it. I, I, I am all for like self-help and you know, a lot of those books are kind of preachy. And then social media started. And then what I started noticing was people would go out of their way to find a photo that they liked or a photo that they felt was sexy or a photo, whatever it was that they liked about that photo. And you can almost see, maybe this is just like the marketing, um, you know, person in me who looks at everyone, you know, with, you know, a little bit skeptical, but they find these photos and then they wouldn't have something to say about the photo because they don't want to just say on the photo, I feel like I look sexy in this picture. So <laughs> they instead try to come up with some sort of like preachy message. And that was it for me. I just, I, I now officially am not interested in listening to people preach to me <laughs> unless they have some sort of extremely insightful <clears throat> um, thing to say, or, you know, unless I, I have deliberately sat down to, to read a book about what their message is. Yeah, if they have some some um you know, if they have something valuable, like I like to read a lot. I read a lot of books and you know, there's there's Dale Carnegie and there's all these self help books and stuff. And yeah, that's great. But if some if my neighbor posts up a picture of herself in a bikini and talks about, you know, her positive body image whatever, you know, I'm like, but really we all know that yeah, you know, I digress, but you know what I mean. But like, it's, like, it's one thing. I I didn't hear what you said. Did you say her positive body or her positive? Like she'll like, I don't know. I I can edit that out. But it, it's like they'll post a picture, <laughs> a really sexy picture, and be like, "I'm so happy about my positive body image," and and it's like you're but really. See, but see, Jeff, Jeff, I'm sorry to cut you off. I'm down with that. Like, if you want to okay. call a spade a spade and be like, "Damn, I look good," and I look good because I'm eating healthy, I'm right. like, "Rock on, sister." It's when they post a picture. Whether it's and it, guys are just as guilty, uh, but they post a picture of whatever it is, and and then they you can literally see them trying to scrape at any sort of of positive message they can, uh-huh. um, <laughs> just because they don't know because they don't want to say, hey, look, I'm posting this because I feel sexy in it. I, I don't need to see a photo of you half naked and read the message of seize the day, you only live once. <laughs> When I know what it is that you're trying to say, I don't know. Maybe it takes one to know one, right? But over the years, I just, I have tried it all. I've seen it all. I've made mistakes with it all. And I'm just over it. (laughs) Yeah. And you know, the thing is, April, is you won't ever see me in a bikini on my Instagram. Okay. Oh, Uh, no. I know. I hate to let my listeners down, but I really have a face for podcasting. Okay. So I, I, (laughs) so anyways. Jeff, you know that, you know that I own a bikini company, right? I know that the girl who does, the girl who does our social media literally does exactly this. She posts a picture of our beautiful bikinis with an inspirational (laughs) message. Like I'm literally speaking from experience. I'm speaking from experience. And maybe that's all part of it. Maybe for me, Ah, oh, I never thought about it this way. Maybe for me, it's work. And so it immediately shuts me down because I do own a bikini company. I don't have anything to do with the social side of things, but maybe I'm so immersed in it that I'm just truly over it. I never really thought about it, but I think that's probably what's going on here. Do you think marketers ruin everything? <laughs> You're asking me that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a constant battle. No, yes, no, yes, no, no. Sometimes. You ever get sick of being on? No, I was, I used to be on all the time. Um, not because I, not because of any other reason than my professionalism. I, I was never fake or phony, but, um, I, you know, to be, you want to be professional, you're at a show and someone comes up to you and you're having a bad day and they say, how are you doing? You want to say my feet hurt, my back aches, I'm starving, <laughs> I haven't gone pee and I haven't used the bathroom in 12 hours because people like you keep cornering me and putting your iPhone in my face. <laughs> like that's what you want to say, but professionally you can't. Right. Um, so I was, I was sick of having to always be professional, but since I've had the, the podcast and have been a guest on shows like this and can just be myself, 
um, it's a lot easier to go to a trade show and be a professional for 12 hours because I actually enjoy it because I, I am being myself in, in times like this right now. So no, I don't, I don't think I get sick of being on anymore, but before I had a platform, um, that could go out, you know, unedited essentially in a podcast or be on shows like this. Um, yeah, it was a little exhausting. Yeah. So fishing wise, um, I know that you started your, your career, um, fishing for sturgeon and salmon. Am I right? Mm -hmm, That's right. On the Fraser. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about, um, you know, kind of switching gears here, fishing for sturgeon, is that still a popular thing on the Fraser or, cause I know in Michigan, if we hook a sturgeon, we're not really supposed to take it out of the water. There's a lot of rules and regulations mm-hmm. around it. What's what's it yeah. like there on the Fraser and Harrison for sturgeon? Are they still a popular species to to chase? Or yeah, you know it's changed a lot. It's been 15 years, I think, since I started guiding for sturgeon. A lot has changed. Um, it is still, from what I understand, still a popular uh, game fish. I know. Um, They've made a lot of changes. I think you, I don't think you can actually take them out of the water anymore either in the Fraser. Uh, and I know that the sport fishing community is a huge reason why the fish are protected. They've recently, I think after I started guiding, they added a sturgeon conservation stamp. I know when I was guiding for them, we were part of a tagging program. So all fish would come into a cradle in my boat and then I'd have a scanner and I'd scan down the fish. Uh, if, if they didn't have a chip plant in, you know, um, in, in them behind their, where it was the gill plate. Then I, I had like a, a needle and I put one in. Um, so that was going strong. I believe that program is still going strong. Um, yeah, I'm kind of out to date on that to be totally honest with you, but I know that they've, they have had some advances. What kind of fly do you throw at a sturgeon? <clears throat> oh, I prefer to have a skein fly. Excuse me. So a skein fly is going to have like, it's going to be, you know, it's going to look like a big row bag and it's going to have like bits of light yellow and pink hanging from it. And it's going to absolutely reek like bait. It's best if you actually <laughs> just use the actual bait fly, you know, that you don't throw flies for them. Right. I'm totally taking the piss out of you. Right. <laughs> like, no, there's no flies. You can, I think some people actually did that. They took like bait flies and soaked them in bait and put them on some ridiculous, heavy line and i don't know where do you draw the line between fly fishing and bait fishing right that's a great question that's a great like so with surgeon because i've never caught one april so forgive me forgive my ignorance and um oh was that a serious question that you asked me about fly <laughs> yeah fishing yes I, I i've <laughs> never i've oh. never i've never caught a surgeon so i never chased one either so forgive oh, so me sorry. just just totally just totally putting myself out there and then get crushed by April. Vo- no, um, <laughs> no, but <laughs> no, but as far as sturgeon, so would you take people out and just throw like, like spawns, spawns at them or spawn sacks or like, I'm trying to figure out yeah. how you would do that. <laughs> <laughs> Very embarrassed right now. Oh, that's, that's okay. Really funny. Um, yeah, no, the so sturgeon are bottom feeders, right? So right. they, um, oftentimes I was throwing anchor in like 60 feet of water and, they're really focusing on eating things like dead salmon. So it depends on the year and spring, you know, I didn't do a lot of spring guiding, um, but we use things like ditch eels or earthworms or, mm-hmm. um, or if the ooligans were, were running, then we'd, we'd go and we'd fish ooligans. Um, but primarily when I was guiding, we were guiding in the summer when the salmon were in. So anything, we, I would use a lot of stink, stink bait, we called it. So I go out early in the morning and I'd, I'd find, Rotting, um, rotting carcasses floating. Um, there'd be like seagulls and they'd give away that there'd be a dead rotting carcass floating. And I would use my gaff, get it in my, the bow of my boat and let it marinate in the sun throughout the day and get real stinky. And wow. then you take chunks of that or in some occasions you use, or some instances you'd use the entire salmon and you'd attach it to your uh, hook. And then you would have like a 16 ounce weight or, you know, it depends on, the strength of the current you anchor your boat you make sure you're not spinning anywhere and then you take your rods and you throw them out and let them sit and settle on the bottom and then you sit and wait with the rods and rod holders then you watch your rod tip and you wait for it to start to move and then when a fish is on it smashes the rod you run to the rod rip it out of the holder set the hook as hard as you can and hang on for dear life what's your favorite species to go after april not sturgeon. 
um, definitely steelhead for sure. I, I think a steelhead and, and brown um, brown trout in New Zealand. I, it's a it's a toss up for me these days. So these fish going from British Columbia to Australia. I mean, do you notice a big difference in in the trout in the two areas, or are they um, similar? Yeah. I don't do a lot of trout fishing in Australia. I do primarily saltwater fishing when I'm in Oz, but, um, well, no, actually, no, I don't notice a big, uh, there are a lot of differences between fishing in BC and in New Zealand. So, uh, obviously BC is big rivers and we're doing a lot of, of swung or swinging flies. And then in New Zealand, there is, there are great places to swing flies, but I, I prefer to spot and stock. So I go to the South Island and find a small stream and, just have to be as quiet as possible trying to get up on these fish. And it's all visual. If I, if I could take a steelhead and put them in a New Zealand fishery or like that sort of river where you're sight fishing, then, then that would be ideal for me. It would be the best of both worlds. So you fish in, uh, like in Michigan, when we go for steelhead, especially in the rivers and streams, I mean, it's cold. I mean, it's, you know, um, February, March, April, we're going for those, those big steelhead um, is that the same way it is in, in British Columbia or do those, uh, still had run year round or. Ooh, okay. Now that's a really good question because you're in Michigan, which is probably the only great lake system that I can say is comparable to BC because mm-hmm. Pennsylvania, New York, like sorry to all these States, you guys have um, beautiful steelhead. Uh, but Michigan is steelhead fishery that holds a candle in my opinion. Uh, to BC just because your guys' fish fight so hard. And I mm. would love to actually learn more biologically why that is. Uh, maybe it's the cold weather. I, I don't know. But your guys' fish are really, really special um, when it comes to Great Lakes steelhead. I'm, I've been nothing but impressed. Yeah, it is a great, it is a great place for steelhead. And um, when did you come, when did you come to Michigan or did you come recently or? Mm, it's been a few years, but yeah, I used to go to Michigan every year. Um, I was always in, obviously in the cold. What I can't was... remember. I'm not trying to think of which months. I used to come out every year and do a circuit with Jerry Darkus and, and you know, hang out with Jeff Luske and Pete Humphreys and all those guys. But it's been a, been a couple of years now. Yeah, two years, I think. Wow. So where do you, are, are you doing mainly spay fishing then now or? No, actually probably quite the opposite. Um, I think, yeah, it depends on the fishery. Because I do live half the year on another continent and because I'm in the Southern hemisphere, I spend a lot of time in the saltwater and in New Zealand, I do a lot of single hand fishing or, you know, casting. I've, I've always fished um, a single head before I started spay casting, but um, I'd say it's probably 50. No, I'd say I probably do more single hand fishing these days than spay, to be honest with you. Where do you see fishing? I mean, you just got back from ICAST and um, the, the fly, fly fishing trade association and all that. Where, where do you see as some of the trends that, that you expect in the next few years in the fly fishing industry? Ooh, I would like to tell you that I was in ICAST proper the entire time, but I literally was in my hotel room from 7 30 AM till 5 30 PM interviewing people. <laughs> <laughs> so, and mostly interviewing people about their past from, you know, the 60s onwards so i don't know how forward thinking my brain is right now i did notice something though that was different though this year and i haven't told anyone this yet but i i will tell you here on your show i went to the drake film awards and i looked around and it was really strange it was a, it was i go to icast every year and it was the first it's the first time ever i looked around and and it felt different and i could not put my finger on it and i was looking at all the like the, the usual suspects who are or who are at the show and they just, they look tired. And I started thinking, oh, well, maybe we're just getting old. Or maybe it's because we've seen every fly fishing video that's ever been put out. I couldn't figure it out. And then I was sitting next to my friend, Paula Shearer. And Paula said, um, oh, yeah, look around. It's all Instagrammers here. And mm. that was really strange to me because I don't know what Instagrammers, like, I guess I'm not that up to date on the who's who of the Instagram world. And, but I did notice a lot of new faces. And, um, and I quickly realized what was happening was the show that used to be industry where people would go to concrete, you know, or to secure the relationships and to get new deals and to talk business. Suddenly the show was getting appearances by people who maybe think they're in the industry or would like to be in the industry or 
they're in the industry as far as maybe social media goes, um, and they get gear and stuff. I, I don't, I don't know whatever their whatever the careers are on social media these days. But I realized that it was just a different vibe because now all of a sudden we didn't have a situation where we're talking business. We have a situation where we're surrounded by really the general public who wants to be in the fishing industry. And if I felt, I felt the vibe, it just, the vibe felt different. I can't, I can't quite put my finger on it. I haven't decided if it was good, bad or otherwise, but yeah, for the first time ever, I felt the industry just felt, um, kind of watered down is, is how it felt to me. So I don't know what that means for the future. I'm very curious to see how much merit, you know, social media stars are going to have um, when you no longer have to, you know, write articles or go to clubs or, um, you know, speaking engagements when you can really just get your merit on the amount of followers you have and, and how great of a photographer you have in your back pocket. <laughs> well, <clears throat> and I say that, I say that it's because, I mean, some people call me a social media star. It's hilarious to me because I, I'm not, I don't make my money on social and I certainly didn't get to where I am today by social media, but I, I, I you know, I, I just, it's a very interesting topic of discussion for me. And I know people like myself who haven't in the industry since before social media feel some sort of pressure to maintain that social media status to keep up with things. But I think for the, I think what I'm trying to say is for the first time, in, you know, a decade, I looked around and, and people look tired. Or maybe shit. Maybe I'm just tired, and so everyone else looks tired. I don't know, but it felt different. It yeah, felt that, different. That's interesting. And you know, we've had some some other people on the uh, on our podcast that's um, that's in the that's in the business and it's in the fly fishing industry and have been very successful. Similar to you, you know, before the the whole Instagram thing became what it is, and um, you know, there is. I mean, April, you've been in the, you've been fly fishing since you were a teenager, right? Mm -hmm. So you've been fly fishing for a very long time, but it seems like a lot of the people I talk to are saying, you know, there's a lot of young people getting into fly fishing, not just the industry, but it seems like there's a lot of, of people getting a lot of, a lot of younger people and that the industry is changing in a very positive way because the millennials are adopting. And it's almost like this trout bum culture, kind of like ski bums back in the seventies and eighties, you know? Uh, there, we're seeing a lot more. Are you seeing that trend as well? Do you, um, not necessarily industry wide, but but as far as the actual sport of fly fishing? Yes, and I think that that's all part of it. And I'm happy that you asked that, and that we can you know put, bring this into the discussion because it's so easy for us to start talking about social media and be like, oh, you know, back in my day, you had to actually do this, and mm -hmm. and why, you know, now social media. But like, let's take let's take let's take out the fact that. So she, that more people um, on the internet can um, potentially exploit a fishery because that's a different part of this discussion. So I'm, I'm going to avoid talking about that now. We can talk about it later, but just to answer your question, I'm going to remove that part of it and say this. If the things about social media, um, industry or otherwise, that annoy us are people using discount codes in the profile or getting free gear or or posting pictures for the wrong reason. You know, this is all stuff that's been addressed in articles and newspaper lately. Here's what my question is. Does it honestly really matter? Mm -hmm. Like, does it, does it really matter that they're posting whatever it is on social media if it's getting people excited about it? That's, that's really what it comes down to. So from a, an industry stance, I understand it's irritating. I get it. Uh, I find it a little irritating. But as an angler who loves our rivers, I have to look at it selflessly and say, but is it hurting me? No. Is it better for the river I'm staring at right now while I'm talking to you? Yes. Mm -hmm. Because I know that right now this river I'm staring at, if something happened to it, all of these new people who have discovered it are going to want to help save it too. So it, it really is a, it's a really hot topic and there's all sorts of area for debate. But at the end of the day, I, 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 I don't think it's doing that much damage. I'd be curious to look at numbers of participation on um, rivers that can't handle it and see if it's having an impact. But that aside, I don't think it's doing that much damage. I think bringing awareness to the outdoors, however they want to do that, and bringing awareness to fly fishing as a whole, I think it's it's good. Annoying sometimes, yes, but for the most part, I think it, it's it's been positive to to see that. Yeah. Yeah. And I would absolutely agree with you on that. So what's next for you? I know, are you still working on a book, April or what, what's next for April? 
Well, I started writing a book. Uh, God, it's really hard. Writing a book is really, really hard. <laughs> um, the book premise that I had had, I, I had wanted... See, what had happened was some time ago, I was really... Well, I've always been interested in history. And I had thought it would be really cool to try to prove that Roderick Haig Brown was um, how West Coast methods came to be what they are. Because if you think about, if you know the history of the sport, you know, swinging flies and these larger um, profiled patterns and, and two-handed rods and spay casting comes from the UK. And so obviously Roderick Haig Brown is one of our earliest references to this sort of fishing in the West Coast. And I had thought um, that he was how it came to be out here. And I, I thought it would be cool to um, go through a bunch of books and, and really take the parallels of Atlantic salmon fishing and steelhead and, and pinpoint that Haig Brown was the man. So I set out to write a book on that. I did a television show about it. But the more I read, the more of a gray area I was finding mm. um, for you know multitude of reasons. But what ended up happening in summary, just to sum this up for you, is I interviewed John Shuey on my show, and John had written a book called Classic Steelhead Flies. Well, John basically wrote the book. The book I wanted to write, John did. And he did the most unbelievable job at it. For me to write a a book um, on it would just be in vain, considering John has done such a great job. So I kind of took a back seat. So then I thought, well, what can I write about that's kind of interesting? So I thought, well, I've seen a lot over the years. Maybe I'll write about the things I've seen. But I'm 35 years old. It's really weird to sit down to write a memoir, especially as a mom. I feel like I've... (laughs) I feel like a totally different person. I feel like I've been born again as a mom. So yeah. the writing has just taken a back seat until I think I just need a few more years under my belt. I'm always writing it, but I would like it, the chapters to grow before I actually do anything with it. Hmm. Well, that's, well, that's awesome. So, so what are you, I mean, I know that you have your podcast anchored and then, um, are you working on any television shows right now? Or are you just, just kind of hanging out doing your podcast. I mean, what, what's next for April? Yeah. Um, well, so um, I, I did, I guess I did go on record about this the other day when I was a guest on someone's show. I didn't say too much, um, but I, I recently merged into a new partnership and I frantically actually emailed my new partner and was like, am I allowed to have said anything? And he said, yeah, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> but just for, you, for the life of you get this paper signed, like the, I, I'm late talking to you, Jeff, because I was on the phone with my lawyer. Okay. And our hour long call went off for an hour and a half. So we're just at the final stages of signing. So I'm, I'm just, I'm cautious of saying anything, but uh, I've entered into a new relationship with some people I highly respect um, with the same level as integrity and the same values. I'm really, really excited. I think there's going to be some super, super cool things around the corner. Uh, television's probably going to be one of them. Um, but yeah, we'll just have to wait and see what happens there. I say for now, my number one thing is the podcast. I'm going to be ramping it up to an episode a week, which is um, exhausting to think about it. But I think you'll be seeing a lot more content coming uh, out of me for sure. Well, that's great. And I know most people probably know where they could find you. But if, if someone wanted to find you or your podcast, how would they do that, April? Um, yeah, so you would just go to um, iTunes or Stitcher or any of those podcasting platforms. You could go to aprilvokey.com and it's on there. And yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. We, we really appreciate it. And uh, you have a great day. Uh, thank you. Thank you for letting me, um, as we say in Australia, take the piss out of you. <laughs> Thanks. Have a good one. <laughs> Thanks so much. Bye. Well, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Remote No Pressure Podcast. I'm so glad that you've joined us on this journey, be sure to check out remotenopressure.com and sign up for our mailing list. Also, uh, leave a review. It, it really helps out tremendously. And follow us on our social channels as well. Big announcement. This is the last episode of this season of the Remote No Pressure podcast. Um, we are going to be back in the fall. We've got an awesome team put together. We're going to be back in the fall with a new format and some new stories and some new, just some really cool things going on. I'm very excited, very, very excited about what's coming in the fall. So stay tuned um, and, and we'll see you in the fall. And until next time, go fishing.